Hello and welcome to Computer Vision lecture number 10. In the past lectures, we have focused our attention a lot on the geometric aspects of computer vision. Now in this lecture, we're going to touch on another important subfield of computer vision, which is recognition, recognizing objects. And it's a very data driven field which has benefited a lot from the advances that uh, the field has experienced with the rise of deep learning over the last 10 years. This lecture is divided into three units. In the first unit, we are going to cover image classification, one of the fundamental grand goals of computer vision. In the second unit, we're going to have a look at a problem called semantic segmentation. And then finally, we're going to discuss object recognition, object detection, and segmentation. Before we start, let's have a brief look at what these problems are and what um, they distinguish from each other. Let's start with image classification. In image classification, we're given an image like this one here. And the goal is to assign a single class label, an image category to the image. Let's suppose we have a set of maybe 50 possible class labels for images that we might observe. And for this particular image, we want to assign the label street scene because it's a street scene. That's one discrete number that we assign to the entire image. This is image classification. In semantic segmentation, the goal is different. Here, the goal is given again the same image as an input, which I haven't shown here. I have just shown the output. But given the same image, the goal is to classify each individual pixel with respect to its semantic category. In other words, we want to assign a semantic label to every pixel in the image. And uh, these regions that we want to classify are both object regions, such as cars that are um, that could be potentially distinguished from each other, but we don't distinguish them. We just assign the label car or stuff labels like sky or trees or grass. So for every pixel in that image, we want to assign one of these discrete labels as illustrated here. In object detection, the goal is to localize objects via their bounding box, their 2D bounding box, and classify them. So in this example here, we have localized a couple of trees, poles, and cars. We cannot localize stuff categories, such as sky or grass. We can only localize object categories. That's why it's called object detection. And for each of these categories, we want to find all the objects and describe them by a 2D bounding box and retrieve the correct category label. So we want to mark this object here with the correct bounding box that exactly um, describes that object. And we want to say that this is a car and another tree, for example. And finally, semantic instance segmentation is to assign a semantic and an instance label to every pixel of an object. Again, this can only be done for object classes. Um, there is another problem, it's called panoptic segmentation that combines both uh, instance segmentation and semantic segmentation. But in, in traditional uh, instance segmentation, the goal is really for all of the objects that we have detected, we want to assign a mask and a class label. So we want to know which pixels in the image correspond to this particular object. And we want to know for this particular object, like what is the category and which pixels correspond to that object. And in contrast, to semantic segmentation, where, for example, um, cars or trees that are occluding each other cannot be separated from each other because they just obtain the same semantic class label here. 
they obtain the same semantic class label, but a different instance label. For example, for these pixels here, we would assign the instance label number three. And for those pixels here, we would assign instance label number four. So we can actually distinguish them despite the fact that they are um, nearby. So every pixel gets a semantic and an instance label, every pixel that is on an object. These are the four problems that we're going to have a look at. Let's start with image classification. Here's again the problem. Input is an image and we want to assign a single class label or image category to that image, such as street scene. Why is this an interesting problem? Well, first of all, it can be a useful task on its own. For example, think of um, recognizing handwritten digits or searching images based on keywords. These are tasks where image classification has a direct purpose. Another advantage of this very canonical and simple problem is that they, uh, this problem has a very simple specification. The input is easily specified as an image. Often in data sets, the images are resized to a common format. So it's the same height and width. And the output is just a discrete um, category label. So it's a very simple one-dimensional discrete output. And we can use standard loss functions like cross entropy to learn such a model. And, and for this reason, for a long time, image classification has been one of the difficult gold standard tasks in computer vision because it requires a lot of reasoning about what's happening in the image. It requires an analysis, an understanding of the image in order to describe the entire image. Furthermore, image classification as it turns out, is also a useful high-level proxy task to learn good representations which transfer well to new tasks and domains. So they, these representations are useful for transfer learning. Given a big data set that is uh, labeled with image-level labels, we can train a representation and then we can take that model and fine-tune it on a smaller data set on a different task that can be a very different task it can be semantic segmentation can be object detection it can be even reconstruction and we get away with much less, less with much fewer data on this target task because we have pre-trained on a very big data set um, using this image classification proxy task and this is something that we'll talk about also. Okay, so how can we classify or categorize an image? Early attempts have tried to solve this problem via hand engineering, tried to come up with an algorithm that solves this task, come up with hand engineered, manually engineered rules. For example, given this image, we wanna find some edges using some edge detector, and then based on the relationship between the edges and corners, we want to, using simple rules, describe um, what's in that image and eventually infer the image class. But as you can already see from, from this example, this early attempts have horribly failed and uh, led to a dead end. And the reason for this is that object shapes and appearances are just too hard to describe manually. It's impossible. And that's really why machine learning and labeled data sets uh, play a fundamental role in, in solving this problem. So let's look at some data sets. Here's one of the most famous data sets called MNIST, it has been popularized in the machine learning community and um, is mostly used in the machine learning community. There's many variants and it's actually still used today it's based on data from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And these are handwritten digits um, by employees of uh, the Census Bureau and high school children. And here are two examples of digits written by um, two different people. They are relatively low resolution, but there's a lot of data. There's 60,000 training samples 
with labels, with ground truth, and 10,000 test samples. A slightly more realistic data set is Caltech 101. It really was the first major object recognition data set. It was collected in 2003 by Li Fei Fei and Rob Ferguson, Peto Porona. And it comprised 101 object categories. Compared to MNIST, it has much larger image complexity, as you can see here by a few examples. And uh, it had met many more classes, 101 classes. That's why it was called Caltech 101. And these objects were obtained, or these images were obtained via Google image search and then manually curated a little bit. However, the data set is still, rel by today's standard, is, is very simple. All the objects have a canonical size and location. They're centered in the image and uh, they are in a relatively canonical pose and often with very simple backgrounds, as you can see here. And what you see here on the right is an image that shows the average of all the images of a certain category. And you can see that for certain classes like faces or stop signs, flowers, um, or motorcycles, it's actually very easy to recognize just from the average. It doesn't contain a lot of variability. So it's a relatively easy data set. But this is how, how it all started. And this is what people have worked with when they started looking into machine learning based techniques for tackling this problem. And then in 2009 came ImageNet, which has really led to the rise of deep learning, if you will, in combination with one of the first models called AlexNet that demonstrated that on this particular data set, there was a challenge associated with this data set. It was carried out every year at uh, uh, one of the major computer vision conferences. And in one year, um, in, in 2012, AlexNet uh, demonstrated for the first time that deep learning actually works and can outperform classical techniques that have been used so far for image classification and outperform these techniques, not only by a, a little margin, but by a significant margin. And this is where deep learning started. However, funnily, ImageNet, despite now more than 10 years after the um, creation of ImageNet, is still one of the primary data sets um, for pre-training generic representations. It's still used for obtaining pre-trained models using this proxy classification task. And the reason for this is that it's a very, well, it's a very large data set, first of all, and it has objects in complicated poses and difficult categories. And it has 22,000 categories. And for this challenge here, there's typically 1,000 categories considered. So it's a, it's a very difficult classification problem. So a, a deep neural network that has to classify the image correct and there is 1000 possibilities has to really do a good job in understanding all the aspects of the image and because there is millions of these images that the model can learn from um, these representations become very powerful so it's all about complexity and size and less about the complexity of the output that we want to predict that's very simple just a discrete number and so here's a little slide that illustrates the pre-training aspect, uh, or sometimes it's called transfer learning. Deep representations generalize really well despite the large number of parameters. And what do I mean with generalization? This has been illustrated, for example, here in this very early paper. If we pre-train a, let's say, convolutional neural network on large amounts of data on a generic task, for example, image net classification, and then fine tune or retrain only the last layers um, or even fine tune all the layers on a little data of a new task, we can obtain state of the art performance on a variety of different tasks. And this is something that has shocked the community and uh, is something that still works very robustly today. Here in this early paper, they, they basically just trained a, a, a SVM readout model 
on top of these representations, but today this is replaced with also um, neural network layers. But you can think of this as having a, a very deep backbone with maybe 20 layers and then have a few layers on on top, a few readout layers that make use of these very powerful representations that have been obtained using ImageNet training or maybe just by downloading a model from the internet. There's a lot of models now available on the internet. You can just download and then plug your little network on top and do something very different, um, but uh, do it well because you have these powerful representations. Okay, so let's look at some challenges now. What, why is image classification non-trivial? First of all, there is a large number of image categories. It is estimated that there is between 10,000 and 30,000 image categories or may, main image categories. So it's a really difficult task to get the right category. For example, there's many different dog and bird species um, that might look very similar to each other but still they are different species. Another challenge is intra-class variation. Here are some examples of chairs. All of these chairs are chairs by their function. They have a sitable area, but they look very different from each other, right? The image pixels are very different in each of these images. And also their 3D geometry and their appearance, their color, their shape is just very different. But all of these should be categorized by our classifier as chairs. And this makes it difficult. There's a huge intra-class variation and we have to capture that correctly and still be able to distinguish chairs from some other objects like you know, sofas or tables. Another challenge is a viewpoint variation. If we look at this object from different viewpoints, Pixels also change dramatically, yet we have to recognize the object always as a Lego bulldozer in this case. Illumination changes are another challenge. Depending on how I choose the illumination and because the, uh, of the fact how light interacts with materials and reflects and refracts at material surfaces, the image looks, might look completely different. Right. The image pixels, even for the viewpoint hasn't changed here, the image pixels, the intensities have completely changed. There are shadows here. The objects are much brighter and there is some very dark objects here because the light source is in the middle and this is a more uniformly lit scene. It's also challenging, of course, to categorize or detect objects when there's a lot of clutter, as in these examples. And some object categories might even deform here in the case of cats. Now, all of these cats for a computer, they look very different. The images look very different, despite the fact that these are all cats. And of course, if not the entire object is visible, if there is occlusions in the image, it also becomes harder to detect these objects or these image categories. Let's get started with some simple models. A very naive model for image classification that you can program uh, in a few lines of code is a nearest neighbor classifier. For nearest neighbor classifier, we need to choose, first of all, an image distance. Let's call that distance D. That's a distance between two images. And in a simplest, in the simplest case, we could just say, well, we, we, we loop over all the pixels in these images and um, measure the, the intensity or RGB difference at the respective pixel location between uh, image one and image two. In this case, we use the L1 norm. So this is a very simple L1 distance between two images. And then if I want to do nearest neighbor search, I, I really don't have a, a training phase. I, I, I just, I do everything at test time, basically. I just have a big data set, a labeled data set. And I call that D here, calligraphic D. So given an image I, 
um, we can find the nearest neighbor. So this is the image that we want to find the category for. We can find the nearest neighbor by the argmin over the entire um, data set. So we have i prime here. And we measure the distance from i to i prime to each of these i prime from the data set. We check all of the images in the data set and, and return the image that is closest to the query image. And then simply we, we look at that image that has been retrieved from the data set and return the class of that image. Remember, this is a labeled data set, so we know the label. This is the simplest image classifier that we could build. However, this classifier doesn't work so well. Um, first of all, it's very slow because we need to do nearest neighbor search at inference time. And even when using sophisticated approximate nearest neighbor algorithms in these high dimensional image spaces, this can be quite slow. And second, it's typically also quite bad because pixel distances, distances in pixel space are not very informative. So it's a bad classifier. And here are some examples on Cypher, I believe where you can see uh, for some query images, what are the top ranked images from the data set. And you can see that in some cases, the classifier was correct here in green, but in many cases it was actually incorrect. So for example, here, um, the frog um, was incorrectly retrieved by an another animal. And you can see what the classifier here um, focuses on is not the animal, but it's the shape and the white background. Or here also this shape of the boat has been, uh, a bird has been retrieved for this boat because the bird is in a similar pose as the boat. But of course, semantically, there's nothing that these two objects have in common. So looking at pixel distances is not a good idea. And here's a little thought experiment that tries to highlight why this is so, uh, or is one of the reasons why this is a bad idea. If we look at these two checkerboards, if you look at the left checkerboard and the right checkerboard, they have been horizontally displaced by exactly one field. And what would be the distance between these two? If you take the um, absolute difference between these pixels of these two images, well, it would be the maximal possible distance that you could get because every white field falls onto a black field and every black field falls into a white field. So by translating this image as a little, little bit, we're getting the maximal distance, but both are checkerboards. They are the same category. Okay, what can we do? The next idea that has been followed in the community and that has been successful for some years by the same authors also of the ImageNet dataset, and of course many follow-ups, is so-called back of words model. And here the idea is to obtain spatial invariance by comparing histograms of local features, which removes the dependency on the location of these features. In this case, translating the checkerboard doesn't change the classification result. So it's illustrated here by this, this brown bag of, of features of this um, person here. The idea of bag of words models actually originates from natural language processing. In natural language processing, it's common to use bag of words, which are basically an orderless document, document representation um, that counts the frequencies of words that appear in a document um, to describe the document. Here is such a, a, a word histogram visualized by the size of the words that is um, according to the frequency that they appear in the document. How does this work for images? This is where the idea comes from, has been transferred to images. Well, in the first step, we extract features. We can use the SIF descriptor that we have learned about in previous lectures in order to obtain a number of features for an image uh, at salient locations in the image. And then we learn a visual voc vocabulary. So we do this, we extract features for the entire training data set. And then we have a big 
set of features for all of the images. We throw them together and then we do K means, in the simplest case, K means clustering in that uh, of these SIFT feature vectors in that feature vector space. And this gives us our visual vocabulary of K categories. So we have K canonical clusters. And then we quantize all the features into the visual words using that vocabulary by just finding the nearest neighbor. So we take each feature and assign it to the cluster from one to K um, that is closest to that feature in that SIFT feature space. And then now we can represent images by histograms of these visual word frequencies. They're called visual words in analogy to word frequencies in NLP. So for example, um, here's an image of a person that has a, a high frequency of these person features. And here's an image of a instrument, presumably a violin that has high frequency of these violin features. And now given these histograms, so these are three different images now, histograms for three different images. Of course, there's more bins in practice. We can now train a classifier for example, K nearest neighbor on the histograms or a support vector machine or a neural network for image classification. And this is already much better than this naive approach I showed in the beginning, but there's still a problem. There was still like the performance was saturating at some point. And the reason is that there's still too many hand design components and too little learning. These SIFT features are hand engineered. They're actually designed for feature matching and not necessarily for object recognition. And also the way we do the clustering, um, the number of clusters and the classifier that we put on top matters a lot. Now the solution to this as we now know is to learn instead the entire model from image decisions end to end from data, which is illustrated here. So on the top, we have this very simple classifier on features or gradients. Here we have the bag of word model that extracts gradients and histograms. These are the SIFT features. And then there's k-means clustering and, and a classifier on top. And here we have the deep learning uh, model that has all these blocks now in green are all trainable blocks. And we can end-to-end -end train. This is the important thing on big data sets. We can end-to-end -end adjust all the parameters. And this gives us much better performance. This is also illustrated here. This shows the ImageNet classification error for the different ImageNet challenges from right to left. This is 2010, 11, 12. And, and we, we really saw a saturation of these more shallow models in uh, 10 and 11, while we had a, a big jump here now in 2012, introducing um, uh, AlexNet, a deep learning model for image classification. And since then, uh, performance has increased further and further, surpassing on this particular task, human level performance, which is estimated to be around five. And the current state of the art on this problem is 1.3%. So it's even much lower than uh, this model here from 2015. So tremendous progress, progress that wasn't was unthinkable in 2010, where for several years, the performance didn't, didn't decrease. Okay, now, good. Uh, we have, we, we have uh, learned that deep learning is, uh, is a key element for image classification because it's, uh, it's uh, very important to do recognition. And one of the main models, of course, for uh, solving image classification tasks are convolutional neural networks that we have already learned about in the deep learning lecture. But here in the context of this computer vision class, I wanna just do a little recap of the convolutional neural network lecture from the uh, deep learning course. So what are convolutional neural networks? Here's an example of a so-called VGG network. Typically these networks, these CNNs for image classification have three types of layers. They have convolutional layers, downsampling layers, and fully connected layers. And they take an input image, 
Here, this is the image resolution, 224 times 224 pixels times RGB. And then we uh, decrease the size of the, the spatial dimensions. Um, and at the same time, they increase the number of feature channels in this network until in the end they arrive at this one by 1000 dimensional vector, um, which is then passed through the softmax. And this is then the probability distribution over classes, the output of this image classification network. So let's look at these components in more detail. The most important component is the convolution layer, which is used at every resolution and every block of this convolutional neural network. Compared to a fully connected layer that is illustrated here on the left, convolutional layers illustrated here on the right share weights. So instead of um, uh, this relationship here, here we have a kernel and the weights are associated with the kernel. So we don't have weights for each of these connections here to all of the input pixels, but we have only weights to this maybe three by three dimensional kernel times the number of feature channels of the previous layer. This is a, a large reduction in the number of parameters through weight sharing and uh, makes these models easier to learn. But at the same time, it introduces one of the most important concepts of convolutional neural networks, which is translation equivariance, at least at the layer level. If I take the input to one of these layers and I translate it a little bit, the output of the convolution operation gets translated in the same way. And this is a useful property that we want to use uh, for images because no matter if the cat that I want to classify is in the center of the image or if it's slightly displaced to the right or to the top or to the bottom, it's still, it's always an image of a cat. And so translation equivariance or ultimately translation invariance in the case of classification because of these pooling layers that we will talk about, we obtain some sort of invariance is a desirable property. Okay, so here's an illustration of this convolution happening. So we slide this kernel over the input feature map. In the first layer, that would be the image. And in later layers, these are just feature maps. And then we multiply the weights with this, the weights of this kernel with these respective locations in the input feature map and obtain after a non-linearity obtained the value at the output. Yeah. So this is this illustration here is only for one feature channel, but of course uh, it is uh, meant to be uh, for all the feature channels. So we have really a C times K times K uh, dimensional kernel here. And uh, depending on the number of output channels we have, uh, this weight, uh, these weights multiplied. Right? So we have, if you have two output channels, then we have two k by k by c kernels, one for each of the output channels. The next operation is the downsampling operation. The downsampling operation reduces spatial resolution of the input. So this is here the max pooling operation, for example, that take, goes from this spatial resolution to this spatial resolution. Successive, successively reducing the spatial resolution until we reach just a one by one, one pixel by one pixel image, if you will, which is then the classification result for the entire image and where information from the entire image is stored. In that sense, we reduce the spatial resolution but increase the receptive field. Every pixel here in the input contributes to the final output. There's no pixel potentially does not matter, that is ignored a priori um, through these pooling operations. And typically, these pooling operations are applied with a stride of two. So we, we jump over two and we have a kernel size of two by two for here in this case, the illustration is with three by three. Um, and so therefore we get a, a, a reduction in spatial dimension of two because of this stride two. Pooling doesn't have any parameters. Um, 
And typical pooling operations are, for example, taking the maximum of these values and putting it here, or the minimum or the mean. Um, pooling is applied to each of the channels separately. So it keeps the number of channel dimensions. If we have C input channels in layer I minus one, we have C output channels in layer I. And the final part here are the fully connected layers. Once we have pools, finally, all the, um, all the spatial dimensions to one by one pixels here, then we apply simply uh, fully connected layers in this VGG architecture. And these are really the most memory intensive part also of this VGG architecture because we have 4,096 channels. And so we have uh, 4,096 times 4,096, which is the next layer uh, uh, weights, 16 million weights. Okay, and uh, here here's an example of uh, like this this last well this last stage here could be a could be a pooling stage, but in in VGG it's actually a reshaping stage. So from here to here we go with a reshaping, where we basically um, take the uh, seven by seven times channel uh, channels uh, dimensional input feature map and simply reshape it into a one by one times channel dimensional feature map. Um, where now these channels are, are much more because they have to capture also the, uh, the spatial dimensions. They're just basically flattening the, the vector. It's called reshaping. So there's different ways of doing it. And this is just one particular choice um, that has been made for the VGG architecture. And it's done differently uh, for different architectures. What we also need to talk about is what the output layer and the loss functions are for image classification. So we've talked about now the you know, input and the hidden layers, convolution, pooling, reshaping. But what are the output layer? What is the output layer and what is the loss function? In image classification, we use a softmax output layer and a cross entropy loss. And we'll see why that is a natural choice. Um, and let's, in order to see that, let's start with the basics. Let's start with defining a categorical distribution. Remember, image classification is about um, returning an image category. And so uh, what we effectively want is we want to um, compute a probability over, uh, in a probabilistic sense, we want to compute a probability over the, over the outcomes of the model. So if we have eight classes, we have a discrete random variable. So we have a discrete distribution, a categorical distribution over these eight possible um, values of that random variable. And this is called a categorical distribution. So the simplest definition of a categorical distribution is this one here where I say, well, P, the probability of, of the random variable Y taking value C or class C is equal to mu C index C, which is the probability for class C. This is the parameter of that uh, distribution. We have one such parameter for each class and they have to sum to one and be positive. Here's an example on the right. This is a discrete distribution, a categorical distribution over a random variable um, that has four states, one, two, three, four. And you can see that uh, together they sum to one, they're all positive. And the probability for example, for class four is higher than the probability for class two in this particular example. And so these are the mu's. Uh, mu one would be 0 0.2, mu two would be 0 0.1, etc. Now an alternative notation to this, which is useful for deep learning is the so-called one hot vector, which is a vector y, like here, that has a one in one location and zeros everywhere else. And it has a one in the location of the class that we want to describe. So for example, for class two, this would be zero, one, zero, zero. Uh, 
And with that, we can describe the probability of y, now this is a vector in this case, a one hot vector, as the product over all the classes mu c to the power of y c, right? Because we know that y c is only one for one c. Um, so all for all of the other cases, it will be zero. So the, pro, the it will be a product of a lot of ones and one element that is not one, which is the y c element. Right. So basically, in other words, with this y c, we're picking out the parameter mu c for a particular class, which is namely the class where we have inserted the one in the vector. <clears throat> It's uh, exactly the same as this, just a different representation. And it should, of course, be familiar from the deep learning class. So here are some examples. We have four classes and we see the non-bold Y representation and the one hot encoding here on the right. So the one hot vector has binary elements and the index C um, where y c equals one, for example, here c is uh, would be two determines the correct class. The class would be two. Here the third element is one, so the class is three. And here the fourth element is one, so the class is four. <coughs> the elephant class. <clears throat> now, given that we know what a categorical distribution is, um, we can now define um, or derive the loss function, the cross entropy loss function by maximum the log likelihood of such a um, categorical conditional model. So let the um, model distribution, um, the conditional model distribution of y given x and the parameters w, uh, x is the image and y is the label that we want to predict for that image and w are the parameters of the neural network. So let this conditional distribution be equal to the product over all the classes um, of the uh, probability predicted by the neural network now. So fw is the neural network for class c of the input x to the power of yc. So you can recognize the categorical distribution here. Now the only difference is that we have replaced this mu c with actually this, this mapping, this function, this neural network that produces the parameters of that categorical distribution given a particular input x. And then we index or we, we take the c element of this vector. f is actually a vector. If we assume such a categorical distribution where the categorical distribution is parameterized for a neural network fw, and we maximize the log likelihood of this model, and we will obtain the cross entropy loss. And this is illustrated here. So what we want is the maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters, which is argmax um, of the parameters over the parameters of the sum of all the data points. So now we have i is the index of the data set, the data elements, log, P model of y, i given x, i, and w. This is the log likelihood. Now we plug in uh, the model distribution, so we get this term inside here. Uh, but in addition, we have the i now, the index, uh, both for the input and also for the label. This is a supervised learning problem, so we know both the, the input and the output, the target, y, i. Um, which can be rewritten as such if we uh, consider not this as a, as a maximization problem, but as a minimization problem. Right. And this term here inside is called the cross entropy loss. The sum over all the classes minus yi times the logarithm of the probability predicted by neural network. This is the cross entropy loss, the famous cross entropy loss that's used everywhere when training deep neural networks for classification. Um, what we have assumed is that the neural network F predicts probabilities, but how can we actually ensure that's, that this is true, that 
FW predicts uh, correctly um, these parameters of the categorical distribution? Well, we must guarantee that the outputs of our neural network are between zero and one. And that if I, well, this F is again a vector indexed here by C, that if I sum over this vector, I get one, that the distribution sums to one. And this is guaranteed by the softmax function. All right, this is the illustration here. This is uh, the equation for the softmax function. Softmax of x is, um, well, for each of the elements in that vector x, x of x1 over the sum of all of the x, xk. Of course, this is positive because the exponential function transforms from the real line to the positive domain and we divide by the sum, which means that we normalize. So the, the sum of these elements will be one. This is the generic definition of the softmax function. Now, instead of x, we are gonna, of course, use the last uh, elements uh, or the last uh, features in our neural network, uh, the output of our neural network, and we call that the score vector. So you have a neural network made of convolutions and nonlinearities and, and max pooling. And at the very end, if we have 1000 categories, we get a 1000 dimensional vector. And that we call the score vector. This is the output of the neural network. And that vector we pass through that softmax. Uh, this is the vector s, we pass through that softmax. And this is then what we call fw of x. This is the output of the, of the neural network. The last part, the output layer is a softmax function. If we take the logarithm of this, we obtain sc minus logarithm of the sum of uh, exponential of sk. Um, now, what is the intuition here? Assume C is the correct class. Our goal is to maximize the log softmax as such. The first term here, this one, encourages the score SC for the correct class to increase, right? We wanna maximize the log softmax. Remember that we wanna minimize the negative log of the softmax. So we wanna maximize the log of the softmax. So SC for the correct class C should increase. The second term encourages that all scores in S decrease because of the negative sign. And uh, furthermore, the second term here can be approximated by the maximum over K of SK as X of SK is insignificant for all SK that are quite a bit smaller than the maximum. So we can approximate it like this. And by making this approximation, we see that this loss always strongly penalizes the most active incorrect prediction. Let's assume C would be the correct class and there would be a K not equal to C that is much larger, that has a score much larger than SC. Because we have this approximation here, um, this would be heavily penalized by this loss. This would be uh, pushed down the score. If the correct class already has the largest score, then both terms roughly cancel out, right? And the loss of this particular data example, this data point in our stochastic gradient descent procedure will contribute little to the overall training cost because it's already balanced. Um, so we see that the softmax responds to differences between the inputs and it's invariant to adding the same scalar to all its inputs. That's something that's very easy to show. And we can actually exploit this property by, in order to derive a numerically more stable variant. If we implement this algorithm, this neural network on uh, a computer with floating point precision, we always have to worry about numerical precision. Mm. And uh, we, can, we can make this numerically more stable by just subtracting um, the maximum of all the elements, which doesn't change the output um, because it's invariant to addition. And so this allows for accurate computation of the softmax, even when the axes are actually quite large. So let's put it all together. Um, 
Here's the cross entropy loss for a single training sample from the training set. This is the cross entropy loss. Now suppose a concrete example with four classes, four categories and four training samples. These are the four training samples. And we have four categories, dog, cat, mouse and elephant. And these are four training samples. Let's assume we have a mini batch of size four. And these are the, the ground true, truth labels, the correct labels here, right? A different class for each of these categories. And let's assume that our neural network predicts the following score vectors here, where on the diagonal I have colored elements in red because those are the elements that correspond to the correct label. So in the first case, for example, the dog has been correctly classified. In the second case, the cat has been correctly classified, but the dog has received similar probability, if you will. Here in the third example, all of the classes are equally likely. We produce a uniform distribution. And in the final example, actually the elephant, which is the correct class, has received the lowest score. So this is a, a bad result from our network. Now we take these score vectors and transform them through the softmax uh, into probability vectors. And we can see from these probability vectors as expected that in the first case, the probability of the dog is high. Then here we have same probability for cat and dog because these two are the same. And here we have very low probability actually for the elephant class because it has a very low score. And now if we take the cross entropy loss, which effectively grabs these numbers here in red and pushes them through a logarithm uh, and uh, computes the negative of this logarithm, we have a very large number here for very small values because the, neg the, the logarithm becomes very large negative. And so we take the negative of that. So it's a very large loss because this is very wrong. But here um, the dog is already correctly classified. So our loss doesn't care so much about it. It's already good. So we observe that sample four contributes most strongly to the loss function. And this is a nice illustration from the Stanford people where you can play around with a convolutional neural network in your browser and you see how images get propagated through the different layers of a convolutional neural network and uh, the corresponding class is predicted as the output. Finally, in the first unit, um, I want to show you some network architectures that have been successful very briefly. In 1998, this is one of the first successful convolutional neural network called Linet5. It has just uh, two convolutional layers here um, and uh, two pooling layers and then two fully connected layers. It's a very small network, but it was only applied to small problems like MNIST and achieved state-of-the-art accuracy on MNIST prior to ImageNet. But it wasn't so such a big bus. It was a big bus in, in the machine learning community. It wasn't, was not a big bus in, in computer vision because in computer vision, uh, people were more interested in real problems like real images and not these small MNIST images. And so it required AlexNet to demonstrate to the computer vision community that actually these models can work well also for more interesting problems. And the reason why this worked in 2012 was a combination of clever engineering, the availability of a GP GPU computing, and also the availability now of these large data sets, which allowed for training these parameters of these very deep, high capacity models. And this really triggered the deep learning revolution and showed that CNNs work well in practice. And from there, it really went very quickly. I just show some lighthouses here, some uh, cornerstones. VGG is one. VGG demonstrated that actually it's much better if you just use three by three convolutions everywhere because you can get the same expressiveness with much fewer parameters. For example, you have, if you have three layers of three by three convolutions, you get the same receptive field as one seven by seven layer, but with less parameters. Um, but of course, you have to train these models correctly. So deeper models are harder to train. Um, and so uh, training, training becomes more challenging. Then in 2015, also Inception or Google Net has been proposed, which is a 22 layer deeper network uh, 
with these inception models, you can see that there's a lot of components that are similar that have parallel uh, streams of convolutions of different filter sizes and pooling operations and also multiple intermediate classification heads to inject gradients also at earlier stages into the network and to improve the gradient flow to improve optimization of this network despite the fact that only this last softmax here this last classification result at the end is used on, uh, at inference time but this is just for improving this has been added just for improving training and then in 2016 of course resnet which showed that, well, it's actually beneficial in order to, to build very deep neural networks, it's beneficial to use residual connections where you loop the input directly to the output and just try to predict the residual, which is uh, much easier because now it's very easy to represent the identity transform, which otherwise is, is harder. Um, and it turns out that these models um, can be trained much more effectively and allow for much deeper uh, models up to 152 layers, for example, in this case here. And it's a very simple and regular network structure, as you can see here. So it's very easy to implement. It uses free by free convolutions like VGG, uses strided convolutions for downsampling. And these are architect these recent architectures are really dominating today in many areas of deep learning. Here's a little plot that compares accuracy versus complexity. You can see the top one accuracy. This is one of the metrics how ImageNet classifiers are evaluated. Top one means your prediction out of these 1000 possibilities must be the correct one in order to get uh, uh, a point. And top five accuracy means that the target label, the correct label must be in your top five predictions. It's a little bit easier to achieve high top five accuracy, but because models are are getting better now we mostly focus on top one accuracy you can see here from this plot on the x-axis is the computational complexity on the y-axis is the accuracy of the models and the size of the circles indicates the number of uh, parameters of the model and you can see that vgg really has a high computational complexity because of the fully connected layers also high um, number of parameters and where you want to be is actually here on the top left. So the inception and the ResNet architectures have a better trade-off. They have a even higher accuracy and at the same time, fewer parameters and um, uh, better computational complexity.